what is this going to do to my health care? What is it going to do to the doctor-patient relationship? So hopefully this evening we'll be able to provide you with some of those answers. We have two uh, really great speakers for you this evening. Um, one is a healthcare policy expert and the other owns an insurance agency, so they will be able to truly give you first-hand expert knowledge about uh, Obamacare and what, what the law means for you. So uh, without ado, uh, our first speaker for the evening is Josh Archambeau. Uh, Josh is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Government Accountability. Prior, prior to joining FGA, Josh served as the director of the Center for Healthcare Solutions at the Pioneer Institute, a uh, Boston-based free market think tank. While at Pioneer, he co-authored the nationally acclaimed book, The Great Experiment, The States, the Feds, and Your Healthcare. He has testified before several state legislative committees and the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce's Subcommittee on Health. Josh was previously selected as a Health Policy Fellow at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., where his research concentrated on the impact of Obamacare on small businesses and the lessons that could be learned from the Massachusetts experiment. In the past, Josh served as a legislative director in the Massachusetts State Senate for Scott Brown and as a senior legislative aide for then-Governor Mitt Romney in his Office of Legislative Affairs. Josh's work has earned coverage in outlets including the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the New York Times, Fox News, NPR, Money Magazine, and National Review Online. He's also a regular contributor to the Forbes.com blog, The Apothecary. He holds a master's in public policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and a bachelor's in political studies and economics from Gordon College. Thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight, Josh Archambault. All right, well, thank you so much, Abby, and thank you all again for coming out. Um, my wife is of the opinion that listening to somebody talk about health care than longer than two minutes is, it should be defined as torture. So I promise you, this will not be torture. AJ and my goal here really is to have this be helpful to you to answer all the questions, as Abby said. Let me just get this set up. As Abby said, my name is Josh Archambault, and I'm, I'm with the Foundation for Government Accountability. And for those of you that may, uh, may not be as familiar with us, we are a uh, Naples-based think tank here in Florida. Um, I am actually coming down from the north. I live in Boston, but most of our staff are here in Florida. And our goal is to specialize in health care and child welfare policy. So as you can imagine, we've been very busy the last few years with Obamacare. And tonight, my goal is educational is to try to explain to you three things. Abby said we should explain what's in the law. I told her that would probably take all night and I'd have to have four or five hundred slides. So we're just going to try to do three of the things um, during my uh, part of the conversation here. We're going to talk about exchanges, which you may or may not have heard about. Um, it, there's two different kinds of exchanges. There are the state-based ones or there are states that have decided to default to the federal version of the exchange, and Florida falls into that category. 34 states have defaulted to the federal exchange. It's a website, and in theory, it's kind of supposed to be like Kayak or Travelocity, where you can compare health insurance plans next to each other. Whether that's actually what it's turned out to be, we'll have to wait and see once you can actually log in, but that's the theory behind that. Also talk a little bit about tax credits. These are the assistance that uh, the administration supporters of the law have said will make this law affordable for individuals. And I'm going to walk you through who are eligible for those tax credits, where you can use them, and some of the, the role that the IRS will play in those tax credits. And then finally, I'm just going to end and uh, spend a couple minutes giving you six things to think about on Medicaid expansion. Um, in particular, this is a huge issue in Florida. The governor has taken a different stance than the legislature, and I anticipate that this will come up once again. So as you have a chance to talk to your state uh, representatives and state senators, I want to give you just a couple things to think about going forward. One brief disclaimer. Now, I've had a chance to do a handful of these town halls this week and travel all over your beautiful state. And uh, folks, the first question inevitably that we always get asked is, I'm on Medicare, does this impact me? Well, the first two parts 
but then I'm going to talk about the answer is no. But the third part, we'll start to talk about some areas where if you're on Medicare, Obamacare will impact you going forward. Also, if you're a veteran and you're in the VA system on TRICARE, the first two sections also don't apply to you. Now, I suggest you listen for uh, the reason that you may have a family member or somebody else uh, in your uh, circle of influence that you may want to give them some facts and figures as we go forward here. So I just wanted to start with that. So let's talk a little bit about these uh, exchanges. Uh, you may have seen in the news, there's been lots of reports about the severe challenges in which people have had to just even get onto the website. You have to create an account um, and before you can even look at plans. And this has been, we're now over two weeks into open enrollment, and there was just a reporter today on CNN who still could not get into the system and create an account to look at health plans. So this has been a severe problem. This will continue to be a problem for at least a few weeks, if not a few months as we go forward. I think eventually they'll probably fix the problems. They're spending enough money on it, so I hope they do. So as taxpayers, I hope they actually figure it out. Um, but it has been something that is not unique to state uh, basic changes or the federal ones. Problems have persisted in both. There are a couple of states that seem to be doing a little bit better job running their IT uh, systems, but largely there's been problems in almost every single state with the rollout of these. I want to talk a little about, there's no trial period in Obamacare. A lot of folks have asked me, well, can I sw switch onto the exchanges, and then if I don't like it, switch right off? The answer is no. And the answer is no for two reasons. One, when you sign up, you're, you're going to be there for at least a year. The second one is, in a lot of cases, the old plan, which you're switching off of, may not look the same when you try to switch back. Either the plan will be canceled, and a lot of individuals have received notices, perhaps some of you in the audience have received a notice from your insurance company saying, my plan, your plan is no longer ACA compliant, we're therefore canceling it. Or, and let me give you a great example, this is from a quote from a spokesman at Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Florida. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, in 2014, health insurance is going to look really different. And in 2015, it's likely to change all over again. So I think that there's this sense that everything's moving, all the insurance companies aren't exactly sure what it's going to look like over the next few years, and AJ, I think, will hopefully flush out some of those changes and what he's hearing from some of his clients as he goes forward, but there's no trial period here. There have been a number of privacy concerns that have been raised under the law. The federal law funds, um, well, requires states to hire um, people called navigators. And these navigators are unlicensed, don't go through background checks, don't have to have a history in health insurance or health care, and are being hired to try to enroll people in exchanges. Now, they'll be learning about the plans along with you because the plans have just been released. They go through minimal amount of training, and they'll have all access to all of your personal information that's required in the application to enroll in Obamacare. Now, there's been deep bipartisan concern about this. The Democratic Commissioner of Insurance in California has been screaming his head off about this, saying we are just setting ourselves up for a rash of uh, identity fraud going forward given the amount of information. 13 attorneys generals wrote a letter to the federal government saying please figure out some way to get a handle on this going forward. These are not like insurance brokers who make a living, are licensed, do continuing education, understand the plans that are in an exchange and outside an exchange. These people will only know about the plans that are on an exchange, not necessarily what's going to be best for your family in some cases. The application uh, can be quite long, depending on your life circumstances, anywhere from about five pages to 21 pages. And you, as a result, you have to give quite a bit of information. So beyond the basics of your name, your address, your birthday, your social security number, you also have to give some basic uh, medical history. Are you disabled? Do you smoke? Um, you have to give a lot of information about your assets. So social security payments, do you pay child support, um, any sort of pension income that's coming in, because they want to use that information to determine whether they're eligible for tax credits or not. But it's quite a bit of information going forward. There's been some concerns about the prices of the plans available on exchanges. And I thought just for illustration, what I would do is pull some of the numbers for the county that we're in tonight. For a 30-year-old non-smoker, pre-Obamacare and post-Obamacare, 
And let me just give you a sense for, for what I found there. I went on eHealthInsurance.com just to look up what an individual 30-year-old uh, would pay now. And the insurance plan averaged anywhere from about $57 a month to $209 a month. That was the range. Um, they averaged somewhere around about $100, $135 on average, pre-Obamacare. Then I pulled similar plans post-Obamacare. The average for those 30-year-olds were $251 for a plan. So a significant jump for those 30-year-olds. Now, to be fair, younger folks will see some of the bigger increases under Obamacare. The way that the law is set up is to get those younger people to sign up, to pay more, to offset, and try to get older people to have to pay less. Some of those individuals may qualify for tax credits, and we'll talk about those in a second. But the reason this matters to you, perhaps you're not 30 years old, and so you're not as concerned. Maybe you do have a, a grandson or a son or, or a granddaughter or a nephew that fall into this category, so maybe you're concerned on that level. But why it matters to everybody is that if they don't sign up, your health insurance will go up. If you don't get the young, healthy people on board, everybody else's health insurance will go on. Even the White House acknowledges they need 2.7 million young people to sign up or this law becomes financially inviolable. So just to give you an example of that. Let's talk a little bit about the actual plans that are on the exchanges. Now, one of the ways that the insurance companies have tried to keep premiums down is by cutting out doctors and hospitals. So it's very restricted networks, can give you a handful of examples. Um, in this state, um, in half of Florida's 67 counties, there will only be one to two insurance plans offering plans there. And in 21 counties, Blue Cross Blue Shield will be the only sole provider. So not a great amount of choice for the actual insurers going forward. Um, nationally, this has been a huge problem. Um, in New Hampshire, there's only one insurance company. In most states, the big insurance companies aren't selling on the exchanges. It's just the little local guys that are trying to get more market share. And what they're doing, regardless of whether a big or a small insurance company, is in the state of California is a great example. They have cut out the more well-known hospitals. So if you live in Southern California, Cedar sinai UCLA Medical, can't go to them. In New Hampshire, the exchange plan only covers half the hospitals. And we don't have a full sense of what this looks like in every state because the information hasn't been released. So for people that are considering signing up for an exchange plan, they need to ask these tough questions about, is my current doctor in the plan if they want to stay with that doctor? or if I want to go to this local hospital, is it even in the network, or am I going to be paying a tremendous amount of money if it's out of the network going forward? So, yes? This is a little bit similar to the HMO um, world in the early 90s, where folks they, they wanted to keep you within a network. This is, it's slightly different in that an HMO was an insurance plan developing kind of a network for you or maybe it was one hospital system or two hospital systems. This will be a little bit more sporadic, maybe not as intentional. They will typically just pick the big hospitals that they tend to think are more expensive and cut them out. But that's also where most of the specialty care for the really complex cases happen. So there are deep concerns by people on the right and left that if you have a really complicated case and you're on these plans, you're in trouble. Um, so, you know what, I, I, Abby, perhaps, uh, not to cut off questions, but... Let's, let's hold all questions till the end. So yeah, it might just be easier um, once AJ and I give you some more stuff to think about here. Um, to, to just close on this point, um, in California, um, the exchange plans, on average, offer about a third of the amount of doctors that you would get if you were on private insurance outside of the exchange. So, just to give you a sense, somewhere between a third to 50% of the amount of doctors that would be available to you outside the exchange or available inside. And then finally, I want to just talk a little bit about the role of exchanges. They are typically run by 
folks from government, there may be some, it depends on the state, but there may be some representatives um, that sit on a governing board that, that aren't from government. In the federal um, exchange, which you have here in Florida, it's the federal government making, making the decisions about um, what can be offered in the exchange and what the, the, the guidelines are going forward. And from personal experience living in Massachusetts, which is one of the states that has had a state-based exchange for a number of years, I can tell you that the governing boards change the rules all the time. And they can dictate to the insurance company any number of things. Almost to the point of how much you can charge, how many doctors you have included, what kinds of procedures they have to cover or don't cover, whether they think it's a good value or not. And there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in which a couple of academics laid this case out. It's public, saying, this is what's ahead. The next step for exchanges are bang, 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 bang. And it lays out a number of those changes in which they think folks that are running these exchanges can dictate to the marketplace what it should want instead of actually what the marketplace may want going forward. So they can change the rules at any time going forward. So let's talk um, just for one moment about the actual tax credits. Health insurance tends to be very expensive, and the president and supporters of the law had said, well, the way that we're going to help people afford very expensive insurance is give them a tax credit. And in the case of Florida, people making between 100% to 400% could qualify for a tax credit. Now, what does this mean in real dollars instead of this health policy gobbledygook? And that means for an individual, about $12,000 to about $40,000. And for a family of four, that means just north of uh, $90,000, at the upper level of that range. Those are the kinds of people um, that can get a tax credit. And the tax credit are given on a sliding scale, based on family size, uh, going forward. And they're based on an estimate of your income. Now think about how difficult for some people in some industries it's, is it's going to be to estimate their income. If you're in consulting or on commission, retail, waitress, um, you're in seasonal work, or in tourism, very difficult to estimate what your income is going to be going forward. Now this is not for everybody in this income bracket. If you have employer-based insurance, and I won't go, perhaps AJ will go into the specifics, about um, the few exceptions to that. But largely, if you have employer-based uh, insurance or you're on Medicare or on Medicaid, and just to make sure everybody's on the same page, Medicaid is the program for low-income people and disabled. Medicare is for folks over the age of 65. Largely, that's the case, the difference between the two programs. So if you're on those two programs, you can't access a tax credit in the exchange going forward. Uh, married couples must file a joint return to get the tax credit. They have to file a tax return with the federal government every year, or they lose the ability to get the tax credit going forward. You can take the tax credit in three ways. You can take it in advance, based on what you think your income is going to be. You can take a partial credit, or you can take it next year, tax time next year, which is, very, in my opinion, very unlikely because health insurance is so expensive and most people wouldn't be able to come up with the amount of money to pay for it on their own and then wait till tax time next year to take it. As I mentioned, you have to kind of guess your income. And the way that these tax credit works is a little bit different from what we think of for other tax credits. You guess your income. If you take it in advance, instead of that tax credit coming to you, it goes directly to the insurance company. Now, if you're wrong on your income or there's a minor life change, then you owe the IRS money. So it's kind of a convoluted way that they've set up this tax credit scheme going forward. And very, very minor life changes can mean a big tax impact going forward. Things like a kid going off to college, and they go on to the student health insurance at the because they're going out of state. All of a sudden, your household looks a lot richer, even though nothing changed. You just have one less person living under your household. Getting a promotion. Maybe your kid picks up a few extra hours at the end of the uh, holiday season, which gets added to your household income, perhaps throwing you over these little income cliffs that are in the law. Uh, getting divorced. Very minor things. 
that I think most individuals would assume getting married, huge marriage penalty that's baked into Obamacare going forward. And the reason I highlight this is because I'm not sure everybody, Obamacare assumes that people's lives are static, that they're going to make the same amount of money every year, and they're just going to qualify for the tax credits, and they're just going to stay the same. But for so many industries, that's just not the case. A lot of people don't have control of how many hours they get and how much money they're going to get. And so let me give you just one brief example. Um, at FGA, we wrote a report which, if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to read. Um, we made it very accessible. It's written in story form, just five stories, explaining how these tax credits could end up uh, hurting people if they're not fully aware of what's happening. And the way that people can avoid a, this big tax increase is if they have to report every minor life change to the exchange. So if anything changes in your life, you got to call the exchange. From my opinion, that's unrealistic. Most life happens, we're busy taking care of our kids, trying to run our business, whatever it is. And so I think a lot of people are going to, to hit this. And probably the most severe case of this is for people that are right up near that 400% of the federal poverty level. If they make just a little bit extra money, putting them at 401, Congress actually changed the law after it was passed. We don't, nobody knows this, but they actually changed the law that those individuals have to pay back the entire tax credit. So in some cases, let me give you an example. We wrote a story. There was a self-employed, um, I think he was an engineer. He had a, a, a family of four.